let's move on to Thyatira, the longest letter amongst the seven. Here we go. And to the angel of the church in Theatira write, The Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire, and his feet are like burnished bronze, say this, I know your deeds and your love and your faith and service and perseverance, and that your deeds of late are greater than at first. But I have this against you, that you tolerate the woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, and she teaches and leads my bondservants astray so that they commit acts of immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. I gave her time to repent, and she does not want to repent of her immorality. Behold, I will throw her on a bed of sickness, and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation, unless they repent of her deeds. And I will kill her children with pestilence, and all the churches will know that I am he who searches the minds and hearts, and I will give to each one of you according to your deeds. But I say to you, the rest who are in Theatira who do not hold this teaching, who have not known the deep things of Satan, as they call them, I place no other burden on you. Nevertheless, that you have, excuse me, nevertheless, what you have, hold fast until I come. He who overcomes and he who keeps my deeds until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations and he will rule them with a rod of iron as the vessels of the potter are broken to pieces, as I also have received authority from my father and I will give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. All right, so we were in Pergamum. Now we're going to follow this road to the south, and eventually, Lord willing, get to Laodicea. But we are right here at this point with Theatira. Okay? Uh, first established by Seleucus I. Remember, Seleucus is the guy that takes over after Alexander. So there's a little embattling here on Western Asia because Lysimachus is in control a little bit, Seleucus back and forth. These guys got a battle on the skirts of their borders. Um, but it was established as a military outpost. It also became later on a place where retired veterans went um, whenever they settled down because it's right on the roads there back and forth between Rome and um, Persia. Uh, It fell to Rome in 190 and later became part of the province of Asia. And it's home to many craftsmen, artisans, and people of that sort who have uh, guilds and different societies that work together to produce their goods and sell their goods for the benefit of the economy there in the city, which will become important just a little bit. Uh, Do you guys remember Lydia? Okay, she's actually from Theatira. Okay, they encounter her in Philippi, but she's from Theatira. And if you remember, what was her profession? Yeah, she was a uh, purple salesman. Um, verse 18, Jesus is the son of God in contrast to Apollo Terimnos, son of Zeus. You guys know Apollo Terimnos, right? Sure, thanks. Um, so Terimnos is actually a local Lydian deity. Lydia used to be the kingdom that was in control of this area way back before the Persians came along. Um, but it's a local Lydian uh, deity, which the Romans then equated to Apollo. And so they combined the two into Apollo to Rimnos. Okay. What's interesting about this is Apollo is the son of Zeus. And who is Jesus depicted as here? The son of God. Okay. So it's this battling, no, 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 no. This deity that you guys prop up big time here in Theatira, this Apollo son of Zeus, no, no, no. Jesus is the son of God. Okay. So it's already a slight against their, their deity and their religion there. By the way, I should mention these are the ruins of Theatira. That's probably some sort of forum area of some sort. Um, but he's also depicted as the one with flaming eyes and brazen legs. And this is you know, images of vision and strength. The ability to pierce through the veil of people's mass to get into the heart of things. And also strength and power. Okay? An image that we actually get from Daniel chapter 10 verse 6 if you want to check that out. Um, <clears throat> but in verse 19 he commends them for their love, their faith, faithfulness. I'll talk about that in a second. Their service, their endurance, and their increasingly greater works. They actually had increasing quality of their works toward his ends. Um, I want to talk about this faith, faithfulness thing. This is a big debate going on in academic circles about Greek. That the word for faith, pistis, is more than just faith in something. And and not quite, and it kind of plays out in the way you actually walk. In your faithfulness to someone. So the idea is if you have, what it's called pistis. Okay? So if you have pistis, the idea is you're acting in a pistis kind of way. It results in actions. So it's sort of a, a belief act. Okay? So the fact that they are continuing to, be, to have trust and act in a way that reflects that trust is the whole idea. Okay? We don't really have a word for that other than faithfulness. But when we say faithfulness, it doesn't reflect the source or reasoning behind that faithfulness as much. But pistis kind of pushes in that direction. Okay? 
Yeah, exactly. So James gets into this, that if your faith doesn't produce works, then it's dead. Okay. Um, but that whole Paul-James debate is a whole other discussion. It's not really a debate. It's just a different perspective. Verse 20, the problem is they have allowed this woman Jezebel to come into their presence, this false prophet who is leading people astray to idolatry and sexual immorality. I know it says immorality, but the word you're looking for is sexual immorality. This is bad stuff, okay? So we get some of the similar things we had with the Balaamite Nicolaitans up north in Pergamum, but something a little different, a little more specific. There's actually this person who is operating in the leadership, most likely. The, the, the person Jezebel, if you remember, Second Kings, she was the Sidonian Phoenician wife of Ahab. So what's problem number one? Yeah, she's a pagan, first of all. Um, but married Ahab, led Ahab and the nation of Israel astray into the worship of Baal and uh, Asherah. One of uh, Baal's sort of the uh, Zeus equivalent in Canaanite religions, and Asherah is kind of a fertility goddess um, ish. But uh, she was also a persecutor of the faithful as well. You remember the battle she has with Elijah over the time that he's ministering. Um, and then on top of that, there was this guy in Naboth who had these lands that he and his, or she and her husband wanted, so she trumped up charges of blasphemy, got him executed, and took his land. So later on, she gets very much associated with false prophets, decadence, and even prostitution. Okay? So this is the kind of baggage that you need to take along with you when you see the name Jezebel. Okay? So this person, this Jezebel, has been allowed into the le probably the leadership of the church at some level to lead them astray to these things that he's listed out here. Now here's the thing. We talked about the trade guilds. What happens if you're a craftsman who becomes a Christian in a Greco-Roman Jewish context? Now you've got to understand these guilds aren't just, you know, the Lions Club or the Rotary Club, okay? You go into these guilds, you will participate in the pagan festivities. You will participate in the sacrifices of this guild to appease the gods for the blessing of this guild. You will participate in all that comes along with that, which sometimes it gets a little raucous at our parties and results in things that you probably shouldn't be involved in, okay? So here comes Jezebel saying, you know what? It's okay to do that and still be Christians. So it's okay to still be participating in that and be Christian. She's leading them astray into it. And, it's, and this is probably not the only dynamic, but it's one of them. To try to compromise with the world so that we're not having to suffer so much. So we're not having to deal with all the difficulties that come along with being a Christian. Okay? And there's, you know, just in general in the culture, it's just easier to go along to get along. But that creates problems that we've seen both in Smyrna and in Pergamum. Okay? This social, this social stress that comes upon them because they're not willing to play nice with the Romans. Okay? So she's apparently encouraging this crossing of the line into this area to get along with the culture, to get along with the society, and still be Christian. Uh, it just, you can't do it. And this is exactly what Jezebel was trying to do. You can still be Israel, but you need to worship Baal and Asherah. Okay? Yes? Isn't this the, the Lord's way of saying like, you should not have a woman as a pastor? Not in this passage, no. Because this isn't she's not necessarily a pastor. In fact, I actually think, given the title she's been given, that it might be the chief elder's wife, who's just been given a little too much ability to influence the church in ways that she shouldn't have been allowed to. Not necessarily because women shouldn't be doing that, but more so because she's just she's uh, she's crazy. Let's just put it that way. She, yes. Is there a possibility that she's not a particular woman, but a but a metaphor for a particular? Theoretically, yes. Yeah, theoretically, yes. Um, the reason why I think it's probably an actual person is because when he talks about Balaam back in the previous church, he just speaks generally of those who hold the teaching of Balaam. And then he speaks of the Nicolaitans as a group. All of a sudden, he gets real specific with an actual name that's being given to this person. It is possible. I'm not going to say it's not possible to look at it that way. That being said, my position on it is that he is actually talking about someone in particular. And, the, and it goes on beyond that because then he gets into the fact that A, he's given this person time to repent and she's not chosen to do so. And then B, on top of that, there are those who are following her same foolishness. So it's in, the group is not being associated as the Jezebel group. They're the group that are following Jezebel. 
So I think it's more likely based on the context that we're talking about a person who's leading a group astray. Uh, because there are those who have compromised with her. Now, it talks about adultery. It may be literal adultery. It may be spiritual adultery in the sense of Israel committed spiritual adultery against God by chasing after other idols. Okay? Um, I'm not, not, I don't think everybody's real solid on whether or not that's one way or the other, but the point is they're involved in a lot of stuff they shouldn't be. Um, but he's, he says judgment is going to come upon her and them if they do not repent. But it goes worse because then she, he goes on to say that he's going to throw her on a bed of sickness. Okay? Um, and that he's going to... And I love the way the Greek works because it doesn't say that... Uh, in verse 23 it says, And I will kill her children with pestilence. I don't know what your translation says. What it actually says is, I will kill her children with death. Yeah. Um, he will, basically, I will kill them till they're dead. Okay, which is interesting because this starts to kind of ease back into Second Kings, where the children of Ahab were all executed, and judgment began to fall upon the house of Ahab. Okay, so we get kind of this same sort of imagery of the sons, her sons and children being killed as part of her judgment and discipline. Okay, um, but obviously, also there are those that she he's going to be disciplining alongside her. I'm going to take it as physical. Yeah. Always go for the literal unless the literal is ridiculous. And in this case, it, it's unpleasant, but it's not ridiculous. So, um, But this results in Christ's viewing being made known. So like when we get into um, verse 23, he says, And all the churches will know, after all this judgment happens, after all these things take place, the churches are going to know that I am he who searches the mind and hearts. How is he able to do that? Remember those flaming eyes at the beginning? He's able to search and know the minds and hearts, and I will give to each one according to their deeds. He's able to know them in ways that people can't. Again, whenever people are judged in the church, we don't get to sit back and say, well, it's because they were sinners. They were doing this thing. Okay, we don't get that. Okay, but we need to understand that God is not beyond that. Okay. Um, he goes on to say in verse 24, that those who remain faithful, those who have not known the deep things of Satan... It's a weird phrase. I'll explain it back in a second. But those who remain faithful will be protected. They will not be burdened with these disciplines. They need not fear that because the leadership, because these groups of people are there who are causing all these problems will result in them being pained by the discipline as well. They don't need to worry about that. Okay? Why, now, why, yeah, go ahead. Why didn't they have that for the other churches? I mean, I'm assuming the other churches weren't universally having the problems, but in this particular church he's saying... Well, he does. Uh, in Ephesians... Yeah, yeah. So if we go back to Ephesus, uh, he says, To him who overcomes, I will grant to eat the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. In Smyrna, he says, To him who overcomes, he will not be hurt by the second death. So, that, yeah, there's still this encouragement. But, he goes, but the encouragement goes beyond that with these groups. He gives them a very significant encouragement when he's all said and done with these guys. Um, but this deep things of Satan... Um, the best that people can come up with, as far as I've seen, is the idea that there was this concept in sort of Gnostic Christian teaching that in order to really understand the grace of God, you really got to plumb the depths of Satan and really understand sin in its depths and have an intimate knowledge of evil and wrong in order to really understand the grace of God. Okay, bad idea. Okay, now I will tell you, understanding the depths of human depravity conceptually does help exalt the grace of God. If you understand how far man has fallen, the things that humans do to each other that are absolutely horrible, all the things that have happened throughout history that reflect the sinfulness of man, understanding that conceptually will help you understand the grandeur and amazingness of the grace of God. But that being said, this goes beyond that. This is like, hey, go participate in it. Go do it. Go, go understand it and plumb the depths of sin and, and Satan so that you can understand the grace of God. Bad idea. I'm not advocating that. Don't do that. Okay. So that's where this idea, they, they call it the deep things of Satan. It's a phrase that they're using. Okay. So verse 25, he goes on to say, Nevertheless, what you have, hold fast until I come. What you, those of you who are remaining faithful, hold fast to what you know to be true. Hold fast to Christ. Hold fast to the things you've been doing. Hold fast to those things until he's able to come. Because the payoff is this. 
In verse 26 and 27, he says, He who overcomes and he who keeps my deeds until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations, and he will rule over them with a rod of iron as the vessels of the potter are broken to pieces. And... Uh, and I will, uh, excuse me, as I also received authority from my Father. This is a reference to Psalm 2, okay? Where Jesus is the one given the rod of iron to rule over the nations. The interesting thing here is now Jesus is saying, guess what you, Christian, faithful, get to do? You get to handle this rod with me. Which we will see again later in Revelation when we see these people taking up this rod and ruling with Jesus. Not this, not Jesus' specific rod, but the idea of being able to shepherd alongside Jesus in his kingdom. Okay, But then he goes on and he's got this weird phrase. Uh, this morning star. Okay, It's pretty hard not to go back to Isaiah 14 on this. Uh, the morning star specifically is actually Venus. Okay? In the ancient world, when you talk about the morning star, it's Venus. We know it's not a star star, but they called it the, the wanderers because they didn't move like stars do. Okay? Um, the reason it's called the morning star is because as the sun rises up, it's the last one that battles the light of the day. Okay? In Isaiah's context, I'm, I'm, again, this is not a teaching. I'm going to just die on this hill, but I am telling you contextually, Isaiah 14 is not about Satan. It is about the king of Babylon in that context. Because what it's talking about in that context is how the king of Babylon has puffed himself up so high that God's judgment will fall upon him. He's not so hot as he thinks he is. And he may resist to the last breath as the king, greatest king of the nations, but ultimately the light of God's day is coming and will put him out as well. Okay? So what does this mean in this context? Most likely the idea is, and again, there's a lot of debate on this, but most likely from that perspective, the idea is you don't need even fear the highest of rulers. Not even Caesar of Rome will be able to resist Christ's rule and our rule as his people. Okay? So the idea is even the one who resists the light of, the, of God's coming day, even he won't be able to resist Christ's rule and our rule with him. Okay? And then, of course, he gives this, again, this exhortation to hear what the Spirit has to say to the churches. So, again, all of us need to listen to what's being said, not just Theatira. Okay? So, again, their commendations, their love and faith, faithfulness, if you will, service, their endurance, and, again, the increasing quality of their works. Okay? But, again, the problem is they're permitting a false teacher and prophet. They've compromised with the culture. They've engaged in idolatry and sexual immorality. And, and again... This false prophet thing, please remember, and I've said this many times, the test for a false prophet, first of all, there's not a test. There are two tests for a false prophet. Deuteronomy 18, Deuteronomy 13. If a prophet prophesies something and it doesn't come true, they are a false prophet. If a prophet prophesies something and it does come true, but their teaching is inconsistent with the word of God, they are a false prophet. That's why Balaam was able to prophesy that which was good, okay, and to bless the nation of Israel. But he's still a false prophet, Okay, So please be aware, because the church has fallen into this mode of, well, he prophesied and it came true, so he must be a true prophet, so we need to follow him. No! Now test him against the word of God. And when he's seen to be a false prophet that way, then you get him out of there. Okay, So just be aware that there's more. this false prophet thing needs a little more scrutiny, a little more care than a lot of times the church is willing to give it. Because if the church would deal with these people when they come along... We would be faced with so much fewer problems just because of that. Solution, repent and remain faithful. Turn from these things if you're in them. If you're not, just remain faithful where you're at and hold firm to these things because the day of reckoning is coming. So this is the compromised church. A false prophet was offering a solution to a cultural engagement problem. Just do what they're doing. It won't be a problem. And you can integrate and still be a Christian. But the problem is that friendship with the world is enmity with God. There are things the church does in order to be friendly to the world that are not okay. To do things the way the world thinks things ought to be done. So that we can be more comfortable with the culture. But the reality is, this culture, the, not just this American culture, but the culture of the world is set against God in the first place. And so there are naturally going to be things that we do that just don't sit well with them. And we don't do it with antagonism, but we do it with firmness and love. And so to allow those things to happen where we compromise the way we do things just to make the world happy, not okay. And we also need to consider that idolatry is part of this. What are we doing to manipulate our circumstances? 
to control things, to keep things safe for us, instead of trusting in God. Because at the base of idolatry is this idea of I can do things that will eventually manipulate and control my circumstances to my benefit and care rather than simply trusting God to take care of me and to follow His promises. So it's always good at some point for us to step back in the decisions we make as a church to say, look, are the decisions we're making reflecting trusting God or us manipulating our circumstances and manipulating control of our systems for our benefit to protect ourselves rather than trusting in God. Okay? And that can come down in a bajillion different ways. Just something to think about as your decisions are made. So again, Pergamum type church, the fellowship cannot allow the practice of false religions into the presence of the fellowship in its practices or worship. Okay? Which includes this idolatry or permissiveness of different sexual immorality and things like that. Okay? A Theatira type church, the fellowship cannot listen to those who try to make us comfortable with the world that is lost and dying in rebellion against God. Okay? Again, it's okay to be welcoming to outsiders. It's okay. But our focus has got to be on God and making Him known to those outsiders. Not antagonistically, but with grace and love and truth. Okay. All right, any questions with today? Fantastic. If you have any questions afterwards, we're obviously here. Um, but let's pray and we will be dismissed. Lord, we thank you for our time. We thank you for your faithful servants who faced these circumstances and remained faithful. Even when everything around them was crumbling, everything around them was going south into idolatry and immorality and foolishness and compromise. Lord, we thank you for those who were faithful and remained, even unto death. We pray that you would help us to have the same conviction, the same passion, the same commitment to follow you well, even in the midst of trouble that lies all around us, even within our own fellowship at times. Give us grace to look like Jesus that we can make you known. We pray all this in the blessed name of Jesus. Amen.